Prevention is always number one. With any disease we're dealing with, we want to prevent it. We don't want to have it come onto the farm and affect our flocks because then it's too late. So detection of the index case. The index case is the first flock that is going to become positive in an area. And the thing that we have to remember is flocks can be totally healthy and normal but still be shedding virus for quite a period of time at least five days. So one of those ones rather than saying, well, I will, I will enhance my biosecurity once I think there's a problem, it might be too late. So you probably should always think about any vectors or people that are coming onto your farm. The other one that they learned quite quickly in all of this is that any delay in depopulation was absolutely disastrous. So every individual farm now in the US has been mandated to have their own biosecurity um, and also depopulation plan. The one thing that I just want to emphasize though is when we use the word practical, for a lot of people it means, well, if it doesn't cost me too much money and if it doesn't take me too much time, then I'll consider that practical and everything else is impractical. So instead I want to use the word effective. You can have something which you think is practical, but it's not solving the problem. And so it's like with any biosecurity program, if you're getting a disease challenge, you need to look back and say, why did this happen? What caused it? And what am I willing to do to stop it from happening again? So I'm going to go over pretty quickly some of the practices that will decrease the risk. So if you look at everything on this list, I would hope these are things that you are all currently doing because they're all part of a basic biosecurity program. Everything from pest control programs to requiring hand sanitation, having rules in place for anybody that works on your farm that they don't have birds of any kind at, the place, at their place of residence, and making sure that you have some structural integrity in your barn because you will see that one of the ways is we mentioned wild birds. So wild birds can get into your barn, that's a problem. The other things that will decrease the risk, I talked about proximity to the road. And what the, the way all of these factors came up is that USDA actually did surveys with growers, people that had the disease, people that didn't have the disease, to try and find out what are the things that people are doing that have the disease versus the people that don't. So workers restricted to one farm only versus having, well, gee, we don't need you this afternoon, so why don't you go over and work on that other farm? Coveralls, boots, and hairnet covers at all barn entries. So this is showing you a bench system and when you enter that barn, then of course you have your dirty boots on one side and you're going to cross over and put on clean boots, clean coveralls and a hairnet, sanitize your hands. So again, that's the break from keeping the outside out and keeping the inside in. The other photo is they're moving birds from a brooder barn to a finishing farm and before that vehicle crosses over to that clean side of the farm, they're disinfecting the undercarriage. Some of the practices that increase the risk. Okay, so all of these were associated with a higher risk of a farm becoming infected. Obviously, if you're located within that 10 kilometer zone, depending on the uh, you know, aerosolized spread. But again, sharing is good in some times, but not necessarily on a poultry farm. So a lot of the farms that broke are ones because they shared equipment, they shared employees, uh, they shared the same rendering and loadout services and didn't have enough biosecurity in place, and also connectedness. So four layer companies represented 55% of all the infected farms. The other one they found too is people that, you know, you try to you know, put your farm in an isolated area, well, what are you gonna do with the land around the outside? Well, plant crops. And in some cases, it was the fact that when people were out working the land in the early springtime and waterfall have landed there, somebody gets off their tractor and says, gee, probably should go check the birds in the barn and they're not taking adequate measures with coveralls, boots, hairnets, hand sanitation, and they're bringing the virus inside the barn. The other one too, they also found that Gee, why is it a lot of the mortality starts on a Thursday? They go back five days and say something's happening on weekends, and oftentimes on large farms it's because there's no supervision on a weekend and a lot of biosecurity is breached. 
The number one biosecurity risk is always people. It's us. It's either us directly transmitting things inside a barn or we're the ones who are controlling visitors. We're the ones who are controlling pieces of equipment. So a chicken farm of 450 employees, 150 of those people had connections with other infected sites. So maybe it's because maybe they shared a ride into work. Maybe they lived in the same house together. You know, some sort of connection between them. The other thing that became apparent is a lot of companies thought their employees or people knew what biosecurity was and knew about influenza, and they really didn't. Many people on the farms felt it's spread by wind. So if it's spread by wind, what does that mean? Nothing I can do, it's going to happen, and that really wasn't the case. Now this is a picture not from the Midwest, because if you're really astute, you'll notice that it's a Tim Hortons, right? And one of our, one of our uh, managers took the photo because he walked, went to go into Tim Hortons. He looked down at the mat, and then he looked down at this guy's shoes. Okay, so here it is. So if you think, oh, I'm just going to run into Tim Hortons, grab a coffee, get back in my car, come onto my farm, maybe I've tracked something onto the farm. So we've got to be extra careful. The other practices that increase the risk was rendering of dead birds as a disposal men method, the renderers coming right onto the farm or getting extremely close to barns. People that shared a mortality bin. Or sometimes it was a garbage truck. So people said, well, they're not really coming on the farm, but that vehicle is going farm to farm in a short period of time and may have been spreading virus. Um, wild birds, which is a little bit disturbing when I read that 35% of turkey farms either had wild birds in the barns, or the wild birds certainly had easy access to getting in the barns. And I've seen that before because people don't make the connection. You know, where they see the wild birds and they're not, you know, the birds don't get sick that day or even the next day. So it becomes, you know, people start overlooking it. So what we're looking at is really, you know, this whole outbreak has caused people to really shift their biosecurity thinking because most of the time our biosecurity thinking was protect the farm. Draw this line around your farm and let's have measures in place for everything that crosses that line to make sure that we minimize the biosecurity risk. But now I think this virus, which was different, brought up the fact that I think what we need to do is we have to protect each barn. So it's looking at do we have measures in place that we keep each barn as a separate unit. Now if you want the whole farm to go, that's okay. And the one thing I want to emphasize is that, you know, although we're talking about high path influenza, you have to remember there's all these other disease agents out there that operate in similar mechanisms. So if it was high path influenza, if one barn's positive, probably they will depopulate your whole farm. But maybe this is a mycoplasma, or maybe it's another type of bacteria like cholera. I'll just mention a little bit about vaccination because sometimes there's people who are like, well, can't we just vaccinate? Like, isn't there something that we can do about this? And there are some pros and cons for vaccination. The pros are if you vaccinate flocks for influenza, it will significantly reduce the shedding, but it will not prevent those flocks from becoming infected. So if we are going to use vaccination, it has to be part of an overall biosecurity strategy, like putting a firewall in place. It can also, vac vaccination can help prevent mutation, because one of our fears is always, birds are infected with influenza, people working in the barns are infected with influenza, and the two intermix. How many people here got their annual flu vaccination? Okay, so a lot didn't, a lot of people don't. At our company, it's mandated, especially for certain jobs, you have to be vaccinated because we're worried, we're worried about protecting employees, but also our birds. So it can work, but we have the cost of the vaccine, cost of administering it, and the number one thing is trade bans. Okay, so in the US, they knew that if they started vaccinating for high path influenza, trading partners, including Canada, would say, we will not accept any product from your country while you were vaccinating because vaccinating says you've given up and you don't have it under control. It's not necessarily the case, but if you can't get your trading partners to agree and they tried to do that, then it's going to severely impact people that are selling meat and people that are providing genetic breeding stock. 
Um, the person, Dr. Clifford, who's in charge of USDA, said at the time that all of this was going on, that vaccination would only be allowed if it became absolutely necessary to eradicate the virus. They did develop vaccine and stockpiled it in the event that they would have to do that. So final thoughts. I have just a couple slides. You know, think about it. Are you prepared? Because one, you have to be prepared as an industry to have surveillance to be able to detect influenza and take control. You know, you can't do something if you don't know that the risk is out there or it's just down the road from where your farm is. Do you have the resources to depopulate within 24 hours? And also to deal with multiple outbreaks. So what happens if there's a, a high path influenza outbreak in BC and at the same time a few farms here in Alberta become positive? Is there enough resources to deal with it quickly? At an individual level on your farm, your responsibility, does your biosecurity program address the risk? So that assumes, one, you've identified what the risks are and put a plan in place. Do you audit your program? So don't let a disease come in and tell you where all the weaknesses are like this one did. And if you've had any sort of past disease challenges, what changes did you make? Okay, just hope maybe it wouldn't happen again.